Our distinguished speaker and guest of honour, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Mr Lawrence Wong, our third honorary fellow, former Prime Minister and Emeritus Senior Minister, Mr Goh Chok Tong, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this year's Economic Society of Singapore annual dinner. This year marks the 67th year since the founding of the Economic Society of Singapore. As most of you would have known, the Economic Society of Singapore is a non-profit organization of economists, professionals, academicians, and policy makers with great interest in economics. Established since 1956, the Society's primary objective is to raise public awareness and stimulate public interest and debate on economic issues. The Society had participated in providing important inputs for various government initiatives such as the Forward Future Economy, the White Paper on Population, the Economic Strategies Committee, the CPF Policy Changes Study, and Policy Options for the Singapore Economy. The Society had also provided a platform for discussions on the annual Singapore Government Budget by organizing a panel workshop post-budget annually. The Society also publishes the academic journal, the Singapore Economic Review. Our SER journal, as it's called, is indexed in all the major economic indices, including the Social Sciences Citation Index, SSCI. In fact, SER is one of the only few journals based in Asia to be indexed in the SSCI. The quarterly published journal has consistently maintained a high rejection rate of at least 85% over the years. SER has been receiving around 700 to 800 paper submissions annually for the past three years, and the trend continues for 2023. Our journal's readership has also risen by more than 200% year on year since 2021. I also wish to update you on our biannual Singapore Economic Review Conference Series, which is the flagship event of the journal. Past speakers have included Nobel laureates, eminent economists. The next conference will be held next year from July 31st to August 2nd, 2024. This is a momentous milestone as it is our 10th conference in the series. Despite the pandemic restrictions in 2022, we had over 300 participants from over 40 countries attending the conference. The SDR conference is a three-day affair with two plenary sessions each day and close to 10 parallel sessions per time slot. The conference covers the entire spectrum of economic science research to practical policy work. Some of you today, here today were present at the SERC 2022, and I thank you for your continuous support and attendance. We have also organized two distinguished Singapore Economic Review lectures this year. Back in May 2023, we had Professor Robert Stavins from Harvard University to deliver his insights on climate change and environmental policy. And our second lecture was delivered by Professor Zhong Wa Lee, eminent economist at Korea University and the former chief economist of the Asian Development Bank, who spoke on the challenges and opportunities facing Asia presently and of Asia's future. Now, economics is a study of how society manages its scarce resources among competing social sciences and the decision sciences. As such, economics is not just about investment, finance and banking, it is also about making everyday decisions such as purchasing groceries, major decisions like whether to buy a car or take public transport, where to live, what to study and jobs to consider, and important lifetime decisions such as when and who to marry and how many children to produce. Likewise, firms need to decide what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce and where to produce. Governments need to effectively allocate public funds to public infrastructure and services, such as public safety, education, social safety net, and pollution mitigation. In all these activities, it is necessary to involve the economic thinking of scarcity, choices, and trade-offs. In actively promoting a series of activities and events, 
The society has drawn economic players from students to members of the profession in academia, the government and corporate sectors. A testament to this is the Society's Singapore Economic Policy Forum that is held annually in October. A leading platform called Economic Policy Discussion in, Europe, in Singapore, the forum allows policymakers, scholars, business professionals, students and interested members of the public to exchange views on contemporary economic issues facing Singapore and Asia. The three universities, NTU, NUS, SMU, and the fourth arrival of SUSS, take turns to co-organize this forum with the society. Past forums have focused on economic and public policy issues to social issues, including changing economic winds, aggregate unemployment, financial sector reforms, the Singapore economy, economic relations with ASEAN, China, and specifically also with Malaysia and social safety nets. Last year, SUSS organized the 14th Singapore Economic Policy Forum with the theme Forward Future Singapore Economics and Interdisciplinary Studies for the Social Good. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister, Mr. Lawrence Wong, who is here with us, was our guest of honour and keynote speaker. On behalf of the Society, let me express our gratitude to DPM for its continued strong support of the Society. Cultivating social good is a key objective to Singapore and the world amid the multitude of competing objectives and budgetary constraints. How do we approach this multifaceted task of prioritizing what matters most? Whose priorities should they entail? Should they be the purview of only the experts or should they be only a government's view or encompass as much information as possible from all segments of society to arrive at an inclusive and informed decision? Sometimes there is a gap between what experts think and what the general public wants and value. Hence, eliciting public preferences requires serious effort as they impact the livelihoods, health and the future. And this will help policymakers identify priorities that people really want. This year, the SEPF is organised with Nanyang Technological University. The forum is scheduled to take place on October 31st at Woko Orchard Hotel. Minister Ong Yi Kong will be the guest of honour and keynote speaker for this event. The chosen theme for this year's forum is Determinants on the Quality of Life in Singapore, which will cover a wide range of relevant topics. These topics will include discussions on health, ageing, income security and environmental concerns. Additionally, the forum will address issues related to the cost of living in Singapore, including inflationary expectations and housing matters. The Young Professionals Career Wing of the Society is now in its 10th year. This initiative aims to attract young economists to participate in the Society's activities and at the same time bring in fresh and new ideas to further develop and diversify the society's mainstream activities into relevant and contemporary issues of the young. The activities of this group include informal gatherings and social interaction among themselves, with guest speakers and invitees from seniors and well-known professionals in government and industry, with the occasional appearances by distinguished academia. Past year, our youth wing organized a major summit revolving around the themes of the future of financial services and the paradigm shift in traditional world economics. Now, collaborating with the Economy Service of Singapore, our youth wing also held an Applied Policy Speakers Series in March 2022. The speakers were Dr. Lee Jung-ho from SMU, Mr. Andy Feng from the MTI, and with the Singapore Business Federation, we also launched the Lunchtime Talk Series in May 2022. The speaker was Ms. Zenia Chang from KPMG. I welcome those of you in the audience tonight who are young professional economists to please join us in this endeavour to further rejuvenate this society. Many of you have always asked me who can be qualified to be a member of our young professionals career wing. My reply is always the same. Well, he or she will be between the ages of 25 and 35. 
But let's not quibble about whether those in the 30 age, 35 age group qualify or not, as we can make exceptions for those slightly above age 35. However, we will draw the line at those who consider themselves young at heart. The society continues to place a strong emphasis on education and nurturing young talents. The society's education committee actively engages teachers and students of economics through the annual junior college seminar series in which professional economists and university academicians participate as speakers on various contemporary economic issues. The Outstanding Economics Teachers Award, called OITA, launched in 2019, is usually presented to the recipients during the Singapore Economic Policy Forum. Besides recognizing outstanding economic teachers, the awards also promote the sharing of best practices by outstanding teachers and encourage economics teachers to achieve professional excellence. I would like to thank the Ministry of Education's Curriculum Planning and Development Division, who have provided support, inputs, and administrative details for the setting up of this award. I would also like to thank World Scientific Publishing Company and Dr. Gunter Duffy, one of our present council members, who has been sponsoring with the cash award to be used for professional development for OITA. The society also organizes student essay competitions with the original sponsorship coming from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Gold medal awards also for outstanding graduates in economics in all the tertiary institutions and study tours. Through the essay competitions, society further its aims in encouraging members of the public, and particularly the youth, to learn about the role of economics and economic thought in public policies in Singapore. In recent years, essay competitions which focus on the non-traditional areas of economics were also launched. One was sponsored by the National Climate Change Secretariat, another was sponsored by the Competition Commission of Singapore, and the Society also collaborated with the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. The theme of, this year's, uh, the theme of last year's MAS-ESS competition was the future of Singapore and what new industries could sustain and grow Singapore's economy and create jobs. The deadline is over and the awards will be conferred during this Singapore Economic Policy Forum in October. There are other activities where the society engages in. One is with the Bank of de France, and together with our Feedback Policy Committee, they organize an event called Green Financing, Greening the Financial System, and what roles the central banks do. Um, we also organized the webinar on the theme on economies read the newspaper. And this new, this new webinar was part of the Economics in the News, which is a new annual event introduced by us and also the ESSEC Business School last year. In February, we held the ESS post-budget discussion featuring panelists from DBS, Dr. Tamir Bhatt, Ms. Selena Ling from OCBC, Professor David Lee from SUSS, and Mr. Song Seng Woon from CIMB. The event was chaired and moderated by Dr. Prakash Kanan from GIC. In addition, together with SMU, we also organized a seminar on the role of higher education in the economic growth of Singapore in February, with Emeritus Professor Lee Su An from NUS and panelists from SGX, Dr. Michael Sin, and Professor Arnold De Meyer, the former president of SMU. On March, 20, we partnered with the Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore for the second roundtable on competition and supplier network resilience, with panelists from the Singapore's Retailers Association, also from Amazon and Amazon Web Services, and from OECD, and also in partnership with NUS. Looking ahead, the Economic Society of Singapore is committed to engaging with stakeholders and the public on the latest economic and policy issues. Besides the Singapore Economic Policy Forum, we are also proud to support the 46th Federation of ASEAN Economic Association, FAEA conference, which will be held in November in Yogyakarta, Indonesia this year. Also in November, the Society will be co-organizing a forum with the Ministry of Health 
on matters concerning health issues, rising costs, and digital health. Our goal in the society is to stay relevant. And we are looking forward to your continued support from all the various organizations in tonight's dinner, for example. We hope that you be able to reach out to us as we are, want to reach out to you. On a different note, it is with great sadness that our society's longest serving president and Singapore's eminent economist, Professor Lim Chong Yah, had passed away in early July this year. Professor Lim served as ESS president for a record of 15 years, from 1977 to 1990, and from 1972 to 1975. He was conferred the Society's second honorary fellow in 1979. Professor Lim's contribution to economics has been immense and focused on economic development, labor economics, economics of Southeast Asia. Starting out his economics career on resource and development economics, especially on rubber, Professor Lim's work has been on the question of explaining the success of certain economies and their economic growth. In this context, he has contributed much to the understanding of Southeast Asia. The other major contribution of Professor Lim is in the area of labor economics. In particular, he was concerned with wage determination and wage policy. In later years, Professor Lim was also concerned about income disparity issues. Professor Lim was the editor of the Singapore Economic Review and president of the Economic Society. His contributions, therefore, straddle academia on the one hand and real-life policy economics on the other. Much of his ideas have been adapted also by government, such as his leadership role in studying the CPF system, as well as policy options for the Singapore economy. Professor Lim played a key role as the chairman, the founding chairman of the National Wages Council, and he did this for nearly 30 years in wage reforms. He also played a critical role in restructuring and upgrading of the Singapore economy, from a highly labor-intensive labor surplus economy to a technology-based higher productivity and more internationally competitive economy. Likewise, in his role as the founding NWC chairman, through the newly introduced National Wage Increase Guideline System, in totally reducing industrial strife from the turbulent pre-independence years of the 60s to that of industrial peace and harmony ever since. And he discharged these very important duties on a pro bono basis while functioning as a full-time professor of economics in NUS and later in NTU. Professor Lim has always remained active in his research and shared his findings with our economics department, staff seminars, and all our conferences. He was also a very regular fixture in, all, in almost all society and journal events. I must also share with you on a personal level my association with Professor Lim, which goes back a long way. It was Professor Lim who first interviewed me for my first appointment in Singapore at the NUS. Professor Lim was also the one who persuaded me to remain in Singapore rather than returning to Canada. Professor Lim was a caring person who looked after the welfare of his faculty colleagues, giving advice, sharing wisdom. I had a very productive academic career at NUS under Professor Lim's headship. Fast forward 21 later, I joined NTU, when NTU established the new School of Social Sciences and Humanities, and the first anchor tenant of the school was economics. And NTU basically wanted a new person to helm the school uh, in economics, and that's why I went over. At that time, I was already in my very comfort zone, and it was Professor Lim who again persuaded me to accept the challenge. I'm grateful to Professor Lim for all these opportunities. Now, let me also acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Lim chong Yah seated over there, and the son, Dr. Lim Suet Woon. Both of them are here tonight. There will be a special issue of the journal and in the 10th SER conference. I'm also happy to share that NTU
has a Lim Chong Ya reading room for those of you interested and is located in the School of Social Sciences Library, which has all its research materials, memorabilia, awards and medals displayed for the public. Last but not least, my latest book on Albert Eusebius could not have taken off smoothly without the many hours of consultation spent with Professor Lim, and it was Professor Lim who suggested the key people and sources that allow me to initiate my research. Now, back in the 1960s, economists had no access to much data and technical tools compared to today. Nevertheless, as an economic advisor, he contributed greatly to policy making in Singapore using his insight and intuition, that is Albert Winsemius. With more data, economics can contribute greater to society from this intuition and foresight of the 60s into data-driven models and eventually add on behavioral effects of these models. Contemporary economic advising is now facing much more complex issues as there are new and sometimes competing demands besides industrial strategy and economic growth. While behavioral economics has offered us with new policy tools and brought deeper insight into decision making, economists have not thrown out our standard economic models in response. We have simply updated them. Similarly, nudges ought to augment existing public policy tools, not to replace them. Neither are superior. A rational approach of weighing the relative merits of each tool for a given purpose or project under examination remains. Similarly, rationality with respect to allocation of scarce resources using cost-benefit analysis on proposed projects and programs and policies remains relevant. The Singapore economy faces strong headwinds. The global pandemic is largely behind our shoulders, but the world and its global economy are facing new challenges. Other issues emerge or persist, such as inflation, geopolitical tensions, financial risk, climate change, rising inequality, uncovering vulnerabilities of our interconnected world. These will test the ongoing structural, social economic developments of preparedness, resilience and inclusiveness in Singapore. On June 28, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong, our guest of honour, launched the Forward Singapore Exercise at the NTUC Tripartite Dialogue. I have learned a lot about this tripartism spirit that distinguishes Singapore as I was working on my Albert Winsemius book. Just like in the past, Singapore is at crossroads again. Population is ageing, fertility rates are all-time low, income inequality is rising, anxieties over the future are mounting. DPM Wong stressed the importance of building a more socially resilient society. And this will require continuation of investing into human capital, adjusting policies to cater to the changing needs and preferences of the population. As today's economic problems become increasingly complex, I was reminded time and time again by my assistants that my speeches are also becoming increasingly complex and long. Therefore, I would like to close by thanking the Society's members and sponsors for this evening's dinner, especially our platinum sponsor, Maybank Singapore, and everyone present for your generous support. I would also like to thank my predecessor presidents of the Society, Dr. Ko Yi, Dr. Te Kok Peng, seated right here, for the immensely important role in building up the Society at its various stages, supported by an able council throughout with an efficient secretariat headed by Ms. Vivian Tan. Finally, to Singapore, which recently celebrated the 58th year of independence, may we continue to achieve happiness, prosperity and progress for our nation. Thank you very much.